Hey, this is Lloyd Pierce, pastor of Encounter Church Belito. I hope this message inspires you, and I hope it activates something on the inside of you to do great things for God. Enjoy the message. We've been on this journey of, uh, uh, of, of establishing identity. And, and I said to you that we're going to be stuck in Ephesians for a long time, but I actually realized that we've been stuck in Genesis for a long time. We cannot get, you know, it just proves we have a long road to walk in this church because I'm stuck in Genesis 1. Let us make man in our image and our likeness and let them have dominion. Let them have rulership. Let them have authority. That wherever they walk, that the footsteps on which they put the ground, that it is given unto them. Walking in a dominion and an authority, knowing who you are in Christ. Genesis 1. That is where we are stuck. And then we go on to be fruitful and multiply. What are we being fruitful of and what are we multiplying? You just thought that we, that was uh, God's um, modus operandi of allowing you to have a good time. Yes, it is. But there is a specific purpose and God's intention with man has never changed. So he first establishes who you are. Those who know their God, Daniel chapter number 11, verse number 28. Sh- those who know their God shall be strong. And do great works. You must first become. Then you can do. So if God first establishes his identity. Genesis 1 verse 28. Let them have dominion. Be fruitful and multiply. This verse locked up inside of Genesis 1 28. You can close your Bible. This is the entire Bible. This is it. God has never changed. And you even see when he goes on in the New Testament, what is the greatest commandment? Go and make disciples. What are disciples? Ones who look like Christ. Not only look like Christ, but act like Christ. Jesus never came on this earth only to show us the Father. But he showed us what humans should look like. What humans should act like. How they should walk and act and talk and operate in a level of dominion and authority. That every sickness is under his foot. Every disease is under his feet. Seated in the heavenly places. On a throne. And if you are seated with him, that means you are seated on a throne. I am ahead. I am not beneath. And God's modus operandi never changes. So when he goes here, he says, be fruitful and multiply. But Adam and Eve, don't just multiply of of this earthly flesh that you have. Multiply of the seed that I've put inside of you. And that's why we say there are many Adams that followed. But Jesus Christ is the last Adam. The firstborn of many brethren. And so we see that that. God says to him, be fruitful and multiply. But what is he to multiply? He is to multiply dominion. That is what he is to multiply. So when Jesus comes and says, go and make disciples, it's not, um, hallelujah, Sunday school Christians. When he says, go and make disciples, he says, go and make ones that look like me. The same concept and the same a commandment that was given to Adam right in Genesis 1 verse 28. No difference. Why would Jesus have to come? Because he came to restore all things that were lost. It doesn't say seek and save the lost. It says seek and save that which was lost. Oh, we seek and save the lost. Oh, we must get the unsaved saved. Don't say I'm not evangelistic, please. I'm just saying getting people saved is one aspect saying a sinner's prayer is not salvation salvation is sozo how many christians walk around in their life 95 percent of people end up in the grave not being whole guess what that means they weren't sozoed oh 
You prayed a prayer to get you into heaven, but you were not sozoed. Because sozoed encompass, encompasses full inner healing. It encompasses full deliverance. It encompasses all sickness and disease. That is sozo. It is a salvation once and for all to solve everything. Not praying a prayer to get you into heaven. That is an escapist mentality. We are not here to escape. We are here to occupy. I said we are not here to escape. We are here to occupy. Occupy and fill the earth. As Jesus says, do business till I come. Occupy till I come. You want, you want a, 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 a commandment. Go and occupy wherever you are. Occupy in the workplace. Occupy in your neighborhood. Occupy in your apartments. Occupy in the building blocks in which you operate. Occupy. Amen. And you'll see this morning, I want to take you firstly on how... That's why we say there are many Adams. Not only is there the first Adam, but there are many Adams. Why? Because if you even see, and I'm not even including him into this message, but even if you look at Moses, there was a group of people called the Israelites. Oh, I'm going to mess up where even the Israelites come from, the Jewish people. Because you've got this whole Palestine, Palestine, uh, uh, Israel argument. Who's the father of our faith? Abraham do you know where Abraham's from do you know where Abraham's from from Ur Ur of the Chaldeans do you want to know what Ur is oh damn this is going to mess you up Ur is Iraq oh damn now we've got a big problem because the Jews came from the ones that they hate now you've got a big problem Ur is modern day Iraq where he lived he left there when he was 75 years old he raised his family his life there God says yeah I'll choose that one what does the enemy do he always distorts and so the the race that comes out the 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 um, not the begotten son the illegitimate son comes from that region and so you even see with Moses how God takes Moses and then the Jewish people are murmuring and God has had enough and he says move these people aside because Moses I know that in you let me make of you a new nation a great nation why does God do that because he knows that that Moses has not been corrupted Moses has this inside of him he still has dominion he still has authority. He still has the audacity to go up to Pharaoh, who has a nation of three million people under bondage, point his finger in his face and say, let my people go. In the face of adversity. So that's why God says to him, another Adam, he says, let's just move these people aside. We don't want to play with them anymore. They don't know who they are in Christ. They don't know who they are in me. They don't know that I've given them dominion and authority. But you, Moses, you do. So let's rather multiply you. You never thought of that. And, and, and you'll see there are many other Adams. And today we're going to be spending time. And I'm glad I have a little bit more time because it's really good and I want it to drop. But the, I'm, going to give you, I'm going to give you scenes firstly how this is God's still still God's intention I'm going to drive this home with you even with Abraham Isaac and Jacob the patriarchs how God continues to the same wording be fruitful and multiply he first does it to Abraham then he goes to Isaac be fruitful and multiply then he goes to Jacob be fruitful and multiply meaning God's agenda has never changed he says to Abraham I will make of you a great nation So firstly, I'm going to teach you this morning how he does it. And secondly, who he uses. So let's go with me quickly to, this is before, um, this is before Abraham is Abraham. He's Abram, Genesis 17, 2. Quickly going to give you scriptures. And I will make, so everything is New King James this morning, except if I, if I ask, uh, Jorash. And I will make my covenant between me and you. And I will 
Okay, are you with me this morning, church? I need you with me. And I will. Okay, so two words we're looking for. Fruitful and multiply. Go to verse 6. I will make you exceedingly. Hallelujah. There's Abraham. Now let's look, for, let's look at Isaac. Genesis 26. Verse number 3. Dwell in this land and I will be with you and bless you. That is fruitfulness. For to you and your descendants I will give these lands. Again, fruitfulness. And I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. Next verse. I will make descendants, I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of the heaven. I will give your descendants all these lands and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Let's look at Jacob. Genesis 28 verse number 3. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful. And can you see it now? God's agenda never changes. God's intention for you is to be fruitful and to multiply. Not only yourself, but every single thing that you do. May your bank account this morning be fruitful and multiply. May your business this morning be fruitful and multiply. May your household this morning be fruitful and multiply. May your garages this morning be fruitful and multiply. Of Isaac it was said that he waxed great and he continued to act. He, it speaks of an ever expanding the Mimshak anointing where today the size of your sphere the size of your ability the size of your capacity today is the smallest it will ever be lift up your hands and say my bank account today is the lowest it will ever be receive it this morning and if you don't like that you can stay you can stay in poverty hallelujah so abraham sets things up when he's actually abraham still for a future generation and you're gonna see you know we've got this picture of uh, um we've got this picture of jacob because we learn and we're gonna get into i think it's 28 yeah we're gonna get into this whole of 28 just now and he does the whole stolen blessing and i've taught you this but we almost have this picture of of um you behave here in the front, eh? I'm just exercising my dominion and authority. I'm showing you, some of you parents, how to do it because you need, you don't know. And, and so they're staying, and so, um, and so what, what Abram sets up is Abram setting something up for a future generation to have an encounter with God. And I'm going to show you that even to the exact place that where he sets up an altar, later on Jacob comes and he has an encounter at that same place. The same physical location. What you don't realize is here, right here, on this ground, almost in the center of Belito, we are building an altar. We are building an altar so that your children's children's children can worship the Lord in that day. That they can come here and when they enter in, you know, we've had people come into this building before. Now there are, I'm going to get into a few things, but there, we're talking about open heavens. And firstly, I'm going to say to you, yes, there is, there is another dimension which I'm going to get to in the end, a revelation that's going to drop. But first and foremost, an open heaven is in a location. First and foremost, many people have, and, and yes, we can open our spirits. That's one dimension, and I'm going to get into that just now. But there is a state that you can build an altar on a place. Just walk into, you can walk into, if I give you the keys to my house now, there's nobody there, so it's not reliant on a person. You will walk in and you will feel the presence of God in my house. People have walked into this building when we had just set up no music playing they walk in and they sit in the back there where Salvin is sitting and they weep 
sitting under the power of God, the presence of God, saying, God is in this place. I don't know what, I just feel the presence of God. Why? Because we already in this small space of time, there is an altar established. And guess what? That altar is only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So that even surrounding areas, the Bible says that all the nations shall come to your light. It means that there's like a beam of light beaming up in the sky. How many of you know you can take your phone torch and beam it? And the people at Lifestyle ain't going to see that. But then there's a light that if you're allowed to shine in a dark place, that a whole city can see where that light comes from. And so Abram is setting things up. He's setting things up for a future generation to worship him and to have an encounter even when they did not even plan it. So before Jacob sets up an altar at a place called Bethel, we know this, and I'm going to get into it just now. But he says, surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. And he changed, and it doesn't say he changed the name. It says, and he called that place Bethel, which was formerly Luz. And you thought that um, you thought that Jacob had such an encounter with God that now he changed the name of the place. No, you never read your Bible. And I'm going to show you. So I told you Ab Abram was born in Ur, modern day Iraq. This is why the whole Gentile world needed to be saved because, oh, now this is going to be another problem now. So if Abram was a Gentile, then who are the inheritors of the promise? The whole, can I just tell you something? The world has a, has a Christianity has a false Israel slash Jewish obsession. We have become Israel, His chosen people. How we pray for Israel, pray for Israel. Pray for us, we are Israel. We have become His chosen people. But if you've got a fixation on a little city, don't worry about the little city. You're putting an emphasis and importance on them assuming that they have a hierarchy and a relationship or an, a stance with God that you do not have. What absolute nonsense. It says Jews and Gentiles have become one. We are one. You get saved. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Guess what? It's right there next to Jew. Chamachi, chuchu. Yamaka, no yamaka. I'm going to heaven. Yamaka no Yamaka, I'm seated in heavenly places. Don't worry about Israel. It's an, it's, a, it's an unhealthy obsession and fixation and unbiblical. We have become Israel. His chosen people. And even more so now, if you want to argue with them, say, okay, but Abraham was a Gentile. Also, Abraham never had the law. Just like me, I'm a Gentile, I don't have a law. That period in between the law, you can take the law, brother. I don't want it. Me, I'll go back to the father of my faith, Abram. You guys inherited Abram. He was first man. <laughs> you are the, if anything, oh, damn, this got mess. If anything, the Jews are the adopted sons. Oh, man. Because Abram was a Gentile. So automatically he gives off of his seed, which are Gentiles. So are the Jews the seed of Abraham or are you and me? Hey, come on now. So let's start. Genesis chapter number 12, verse number 4. I'm going to take you on a little journey. It's very good. It's very, very good. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old. So he departed from Iraq. Okay? Ur. Was 75 years old when he departed from, remember, Haran. Just put up that image for, for me, and I'm not going to use it again. I just want to give you some context because the picture helps you a bit. So, so this picture here, you look on the bottom right. You have Chaldea, which is Ur. Okay, there's Babylon. So that's where, don't worry about all the other, I'm explaining to you how this works. Okay, Ur is there. That's where he lived, Mesopotamia. Okay, modern day Iraq. Now this whole region here is where they fight. Okay? Everywhere. 
my, this is mine, what's yours, mine, my, my, okay, whatever. It's God's. Let's just say it like that. <laughs> so he starts there. In this scripture where we're talking about is he's moving up. He's moving up to Haran. And then later on, so you can see it says the journeys of Abraham in red. So he starts off moving up along the Euph Euphrates River up to Mesopotamia to a place called Haran. Then he moves down, okay? And you'll see there it says Bethel down there. Can you see it? Bethel, Beersheba, just above Edom. Okay, so have this picture in your mind that we have Haran at the top. Uh, we have Mesopotamia on the left where he moves up and then Bethel on the right. That's all that you need to know. Okay, you can go back. And Lot went with him, and he was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Meaning that he first started at Ur, he went up to Haran, then he goes down, and he moves down. Go to, um, go to verse number 7 for me. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Next verse. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. This is like, it's still in Bethel. It's almost like saying Belito on the east and Salt Rock on the west. Okay? If you look at other maps, Bethel and Ai are the same place. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So we have a situation now where he moves from Haran and the Lord says to move down. He moves down to a place of Bethel and he establishes an altar. He has an encounter with God. If you want to see, why, do, why are we called encounter? Because the birthplace of everything that we stand for. Yes, it happened with, 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 um, with Adam in the garden. But here when it comes to not those where Adam and Eve were, humans but also somewhat celestial beings because they operated and they had a crown of glory and honor i've taught this to you they were literally clothed with a cloak of glory whereas these are your first humans the first time that god establishes his covenant is here with abram and he has what he has an encounter with god so what is the modus operandi what does god do how does God establish his covenant with the people? He has an encounter with them. Oh, I don't know if you're receiving it this morning. If you want God to establish your, his covenant with you, if you want situations in your life to be fruitful and multiply, if you want to stop having marital problems, guess what you need? You need an encounter with the living God. Very simple. And so he builds an altar there. And so it says Bethel. But now I explain to you, we have a problem because Jacob called the place Bethel, Highball. But Jacob, you lied because Bethel, there's Bethel over there. Genesis 12, I don't know about you, but I know that 12 comes before 28. And a grandfather comes before a grandson. And you thought all of a sudden this place, Bethel, appeared. And Jacob was the one who had this amazing encounter. The first of its kind. Angels are sending it. No. Abram. Abram set up an altar to God. At that place called Bethel. Then Abram moves from that place. Go to Genesis. Uh, um, uh, go to 12 verse 10. And it says there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. Now, how many of you know, if you just go and look at, an, at, a, at, a, at a map, we know Egypt is desert, right? Egypt in the scriptures always symbolizes wilderness. So, circumstances get hard. Abram moves from a place of an encounter, moves from Bethel, which is called the house of God, to a place which is desolate and without God. Then God says, Genesis 13, verse 1. 13, 1. Then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot him to the south. Continue. 
Ab Lloyd was very rich in, I mean, Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. You see how I read the scripture? You can read it another way. Me, I read like that. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Ethel and Bethel and Ai. Oh, I wish you can see this prophetically. What happened is, is he was in a place of wilderness, a place of dryness. I hope you're listening prophetically. A place where nothing was happening. God says to him, what did he end up doing? He goes, place, he goes back to the place where his tent, what was a tent? A tent was a dwelling. Had been at the beginning. What this means for you and me is maybe there's a posture Maybe there's a place when you first got saved. There's a place even if you first walked into this church and you were excited for the things of God. There was a fire burning within your spirits. And you said, God, I will do this and God, I will do that. I'm not talking of dead works. I'm talking from a place where you know that you've had an encounter with God. And God is saying, go back to that place where you have been at the beginning. That place where you had an encounter with me, where it's no longer dry, where it's no longer wilderness. Move out from the place that is dry into the place where you had an encounter with me. What did you look like when you were doing there? How pure was your spirit? And I'm not talking about dead works because there's a difference. Do we still pray? Yes, do we still pray? Of course we still pray. Do we fast? Yes. Why do we do it now? Because I've had a love encounter with God. There's a difference. I can, I can talk about, we were joking last night about uh, uh, cleaning the dishes, you know. And I said, yeah, maybe if you cook meals for me, then maybe I'll clean the dishes. But then I backtrack. I said, no, no, I won't. I won't clean the dishes. Firstly, I have someone employed for that. But secondly, I also have a nice dishwasher for that. But how many of you know as a husband and wife, you know, prophet always says, he says, you must read and study the Bible under different lenses. The first is a new covenant lens, a new creation reality lens. The second is under grace. The third is under father and sonship. I would like to add a fourth, a, a husband and wife. You must understand that the relationship between Christ and his body is the same as a relationship between a husband and wife. So what does my relationship look like with Christ? The same as that. So don't call something that is done out of love and wanting to please someone out of a good motive. Don't call that dead works. Oh, now Christians get lazy and they do nothing. So if, if, if you as a husband, because your wife is wara wara waraing at you, go and take out the trash or do the dishes and you do it out of obligation because you feel that you're forced to do it. Is that the same as I love my wife and I know that when she comes home from the shops and she sees a, a, a sink that is empty and the dishes are washed, that she will appreciate that. Very, very different. Am I right? When you take out the trash because you know that helping or if we get set up and like usually we have people come over and then maybe she needs to go to the shops and we with the kids, we've cleaned up the house, made sure the pool is sorted outside and she comes to her house and she walks and she's like, wow, the house is sorted. There's a pleasing aspect to her that is very different from dead works. So this posture that I'm talking about, this posture I'm talking about, this place, go back to the place that at the beginning, when your life was so on fire that all you wanted was God. That everything seemed dim in the light of who He is. That your life is consumed by everything He has to offer. You said, if it takes me fasting to get closer to Him, I will do it. If it takes me praying to get closer to Him, I will do it. If it takes me putting down this thing, cutting off that relationship, I will do whatever I need to do to strengthen my relationship and to have an encounter with God. God is saying, get, place, get back to that place that you were at at the beginning. And so, go to the next verse. 
to the place of the altar which he had made there at first and there that place Bethel house of God there Abram called on the name of the Lord I have a place where my altar is built not only in this church in my house I have a place I can go there and at any time I can call upon the name of the Lord because the altar is there an establishment of an open heaven is there in my room it's there on this on this pulpit in this frontier there is an altar built an open heaven a portal to heaven itself There must be a place where you know that you had an encounter. How many of you have found a place where you've had an encounter called encounter? You think this thing is just a name that we brought up? No, because we know that this is God's plan and purpose. This is how he fulfills his covenant within the earth. So now we go to Jacob, the grandson. So Jacob is the grandson of Abraham. This guy you know, we say, oh, we assume that Jacob was saved and serving the Lord just by virtue of all the stories we read, by virtue of the fact that God, you know, God uses it later on down the line. Only after he's had a covenant with him does he begin to say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When he comes to, when he comes to, to Jacob, he says the God of Abraham and the God of your father, Isaac. Why? Because he's not your God yet. Paul says, I pray to my God, meaning that there was a certain realm and a revelation Jacob did not have. Yes, he, he inherited the blessing. Why? Because he stole it. The guy is such a rubbish in the, in the womb. He needs discipline. Grips his brother's ankle and says, no, brother. Me. I'm fast. So they were twins. His, his name literally means supplanter. Listen, he was a, a bad, he was a badass. Let me say it like that. <laughs> I said it now. Jacob was not a good, he was not saved. I, I need to explain this to you. We have this perception. It's like some of you bring your, I'm not going to look now at the congregation because then you're going to think it's me talking specifically to you. It's like some of you, you bring your children to the church and they sit next to you. But I don't know if they're sitting next to you in the heavenly places, if you know what I mean. And I don't know if they have to die, if they will continue to sit in the sanctuary. You know, inherited salvation, no such thing. You must have an encounter for yourself. You must have an encounter for yourself. Don't live off of the encounter that the preacher has. Don't live off of the fire that the preacher has. You must develop your own. You must kindle your own fire. What does Paul do when he just gets to a new nation? He goes to that island. What is that island called? Patmos. No. That's John, Abby Yellis with the Bible. What's that island called? When he was about to, he said, don't worry, there won't be shipwreck. And he ends up on the island with the islanders. Malta, thank you. My wife's the only one that knows the Bible. Will she check Google? Okay, I forgive you. Y'all need Jesus. What does he do as soon as they end up on that island? He kindles a fire. What are we doing here? Kindling a fire. So that anyone who comes to this altar, maybe, just maybe, they will catch a light and do something for God. You must have an encounter for yourself. And so now we talk about Jacob as though he's, as though he's someone saved. He's not saved. Even with this encounter, you're going to see there's this whole story. His, his, his father Isaac blesses him. And he gives him, I showed you the same thing where he says, bless you and multiply you and, and be fruitful and multiply. Then Jacob somewhere goes on a journey. He says, okay, I know that in order to multiply, I need some help. 
if you know what I'm saying. He can't multiply out of himself. You know, he needs, uh, takes two to tango. You know, he needs a throw means. Okay? And so, and so, Jacob is on the hunt for a wife. How do we know that he's on the hunt for a wife? Because after he has the encounter at Bethel, guess what he does? Guess what he does? He carries on. He said, hey, let me do that thing, carry on the do the thing that I was doing before. But now go with me to Genesis chapter number 28, verse number 10. Are you with me? Now Jacob went out from Beersheba to toward Haran. Now, if you remember, just put the put the thing back on. So Beersheba is Beersheba is on the bottom. Okay? Now he's going towards Haran. What's on the way from Beersheba to Haran? That is popular with us this morning. What is it? Bethel. Okay, go back. 28 verse 10. You recognize that. Same as Genesis chapter number 12, verse number 4. But except Abram was going the other way. Jacob doesn't even know. But he is beginning a journey that his forefathers, his grandfather Abraham, some many years back began. And he didn't know that there was something waiting for him at a certain place. Hmm. It's funny I say certain place. Go to verse number 11. Oh, I want this to drop with you. It says, so he came to a certain place. Now later on, we know that this certain place is called Bethel because he reveals it to us. But right here, we don't know what this place is. And stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones. And stones of that place and put it at his head. And he lay down in that place to sleep. This word certain place here. In the Greek. Sorry, in the Hebrew because Old Testament is Hebrew. In the Hebrew, the way that this thing is structured. It's not just certain place. Certain place is. The word certain, mean, a certain place means a place where God dwells. It means a temple, a sanctuary, a holy place. But it is so powerful. It means like a monument that is set up. A mountain where people have worshipped the Lord before. Oh. What this means is that, so he came, even so he came. It doesn't mean, oh, he came. Oh, it's a certain place. I feel like staying here. It means that, imagine, you know, and we've seen this with the prophets in the prophetic retreat, standing on a pulpit, and he walks, and the man gets hit and gets flung five meters backwards on the floor, lying out underneath the power of God for hours. This is the picture that happens to, to Jacob. He ends up his journey to, from Haran. He's going up towards uh, towards Haran and he enters the certain place and the way that the that the structure works is like he's busy walking and he bumps into God oh, I don't know if you're catching it this morning may you on your journey to wherever you are going bump into God may although you came here for one reason may you have an encounter with the living God that although your agenda is to maybe get a wife, is to maybe get business, is to maybe clear debts, may you bump into His presence. May you bump into an altar that was built. And Jacob bumps into God. And that's why he sets up a stone. Let me not even get into the stone. That will happen at the end. And he put his head and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending, not descending and ascending, meaning that they were already on the earth. They were ascending, meaning that this had now become a gateway and a portal from earth to heaven and heaven to earth. 
that if God wants to fulfill His purpose on the earth, that He uses His gates and His portals. Oh. If I need to dispatch my angels, I know that there is a man, there is someone that sets up an altar on the earth. And where an altar is set up, there we put up a ladder. Angels, there are gates that you must use. Ah. There is a gate called Encounter Church Belito, where angelic activity is, where angels ascend and descend. And do the will of the Father in a region. And there the angels were ascending and descending. Next verse. And behold, the Lord stood above it, said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Now Jacob is beginning to have his own encounter. First, God introduces himself as Abraham, your father, and God of Isaac. Next verse. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, north and south. And in you and your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now it changes. And God starts speaking not in the tone of Abraham and Isaac, but he speaks in the tone of you. Behold, Jacob, I am with, and I will keep wherever, and I will bring, for I will not leave until I have done what I have spoken to. God is now establishing his covenants with Jacob himself. No longer is he the God of Abraham and Isaac. May you this morning, may he not only be the God of Prophet Leon and the God of Pastor Lloyd or the God of your e-group leader. May he be the God of you this morning. Put your name in there. He is with you. He will keep you wherever you go. God is now having an encounter with Jacob. Jacob is having an encounter with God. Next verse. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. This here even confirms that the altar was set up long before he got there. It was only now that he began to recognize it. Meaning the altar of the Lord, surely God was, it's the house of God. God lives there and dwells there. God chooses to live and dwell, not in a temple made of human hands. But now he lives inside of us. There's places that God dwells. God lives in. Next verse. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, Bethel. And this is the gate of heaven. I'm going to get back to that. But just go. He took the stone, set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of that. Even there's so much here. Oh my God. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city had been Luz previously. Yes, it had. But before, with Abram, it was called Luz. Jake... Jacob was not the one who had a revelation that this was the house of God. It was Abram. And Abram set up the altar. The reason that he now calls that place Bethel, because previously to him it was Luz. <sighs> Maybe some of you have come into this place and it's just that church. You know? Let it be the place where you say it's an encounter with God. Let it be a place where it's not only somebody else experiencing. And this is a great place. God is doing great miracles and great testimonies. Let it be a place for you where you have an encounter with God. Where you can say this, just as Jacob, before it might have been named something else. But for me now I know that this is the place of encounter. This is the place where the altar of God is set up. This is the place where the glory of God dwells. The house of God. 
Now I know, I have personal revelation that this is none other than the house of God. And so he says, go back to verse number 17. I don't even know, I'm, I'm jumping so much here. Are you receiving? Let's see where I am. Go with me. Go with me back to verse number three. How, so how does he give this? This I want to give you some. We're gonna. We're gonna. Oh, geez, we're early. My God. Hallelujah. Is it meaty enough for you receiving? You know, if if I can give you one thing today, it's an encounter with God. Man, have I had some encounters with God? And as I was preparing this morning, I already knew this message in my spirit. And I was just lying there and weeping under the presence in my office. And I just said, God, if, I could, if one thing can happen, that they will understand that they can have a revelation and an encounter with you for themselves. Not come and glean off of what the atmosphere has, but that an altar can be set up even in their own home. That they can have an open heaven over their life. And so you see here, God does it in a certain manner. Abram gave Isaac the ability to have an encounter. Isaac, although it's from God, it comes. Jacob, although it's from God, it comes from Isaac. This is Isaac speaking here to Jacob. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply, that you may be an assembly of, pe of peoples. That means... That because Abram had an encounter, he could give it to Isaac. Because Isaac had an encounter, he could give it to Jacob. If I have an encounter, I can give it to you. We've said before that the same presence, the same manifestation. If I'm in my room and the glory of God is saturating me there. And the weight of his presence is there. Wherever I've had that, if I've entered a realm and a dimension even just of me speaking it because here Isaac is declaring it over him meaning that Isaac says I've tapped into a realm Jacob I've tapped into a realm now this realm I impart to you I give it to you may you go in the same manner that I have been fruitful in the same manner that I have been prosperous, may God Almighty bless you. And may He now not only have done it for God of the God of your grandfather Abraham and the God of me, but now may He make you fruitful and multiply you. This is before Jacob goes and sets his journey to Haran. Meaning that although firstly Jacob Firstly, Abram had set up an altar. It was waiting there for him. But then he had someone called his father Isaac who put his hand on his head, who blessed him and said, go forth. So even on before the journey, there was a place, but there was also a purpose locked up inside of him already. He already had all the tools. It's like he already had the wood on his back. He already had the flint to light the fire. He already had the fire starters. At the moment that the place where he pitched up at Bethel, all these things came together in a culmination. The altar was set up. His father had blessed him. And there he bumped into God and had an encounter. So firstly, not only are we busy setting up altars here for future generations, but when we impart and when we bless, it equips them to be able to walk in the same thing. I can even tell you, some of the encounters I've had is purely because of my father's uh, prophet Leon. 100%. Realms and dimensions that I have walked in. Realms and dimensions and encounters that I've entered into. Some of them are purely because of him. Of dimensions that he has walked in. Amen. May it be the same for you this morning. That's why there's such powerful that's why there was even impartation 
in a testimony. The Bible says we have overcome it, overcome it by, the, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Meaning that just by you, someone being up here and saying that the Lord blessed us and I've got miracle money in my bank accounts of 170,000 rand plus, you can say, I cut a lambano that. I snatch that. I take it for me. If God can do it for that person, there is no reason that God cannot do it for me. If someone comes up here and says that they've been healed of cancer, guess what? Cancer no longer has dominion in this building. Do you understand what I'm saying? It means that now, although I have a revelation, although I have it, I know God can do it. Once He's done it, you begin to know. Whoever lady, she's here. I know she doesn't want to use the mic, so I'll give the testimony on her behalf. Smoking her whole life. 80 years old now, since she was 14. 60 plus years smoking. After, after a service comes here and says, please pray for me. They've said, my lungs are black. Emphysema can do nothing. Nothing I can do at this age. Just live with it until it takes over and that's it. So we do what we know how. I say we do what we know how. We lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's what the Bible says. Do I have the power to heal the sick? No. The one living inside of me, his name is Jesus. So we lay hands. I hear his testimony this week. Went back to the doctor. It starts off firstly that you must spit and then you can see if there's something there. They couldn't see anything there. They did test. Emphysema gone. Gone. 80 years old. Smoking for 60 years. I'm 38. I can't even calculate 60 years. Living. Never mind. Never mind smoking for that long. How many of you know that God even removes the consequences of sin? Oh, you don't like that. How's that for freedom, eh? It's your fault. Don't smoke. That's what, I'm the doctor, I'm like, don't smoke. Stop smoking. She was smoking so much that the doctor even said, you can't stop smoking. Your lungs will collapse. You have to wean off. So if you see her smoking, don't get religious, eh? Doctor's orders, yeah. <laughs> Emphysema gone. Man, that is a miracle. That is nothing short of a miracle. I will go even as far as to say a creative miracle. Because she, the lungs were clear. So either God removed it or he just said, ah, you know, now these days you go to the panel beater, they don't fix. You got a ding on your bumper, they put some a new one. God operate the same. Say, I can waste time fixing this thing here, but it's still the old one. But guess what? I made you a new creation. I might as well give you some new lungs. When you hear that, when you hear that testimony, there's impartation for you to receive the same miracle. Now, hopefully you don't need a healing from emphysema, but you know, you know what I mean. Now go with me, the last revelation here. Genesis 28 from verse number 17. I want one more thing to drop. So the Lord, first his mode, his mode, he uses a place. An altar is set up at a place, but there's another dimension. And Jacob says, and he was afraid, and he said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven say with me gate of heaven a gate this is why i said to you it is a point of entrance and a point of exit when you enter into a place and when you exit a place it is a gate so he he had a revelation that at this point god had set up a gate at a place called bethel where if the angels need to enter earth and exit earth they use a place called bethel they use a place called Encounter. I mean, a place called Bethel. He says, this is none other than the gate of heaven. And then he pointed at something. And he poured oil on the rock. I mean, a rock. And he lay his head on the stone. I mean, 
Christ. Meaning that as he was there, he began to get a revelation that when I have an encounter with God, what is the first thing that you end up doing? You enter into a state of rest. Ah. And where is that rest? It is found on the rock, which is Christ. Ah, tonight I'm going to get into how to truly enter into rest. If you struggle with any form of fear, anxiety, weight, depression, anything in that manner, this evening will give you a revelation of, of entering into true rest. How many of you want to hear that? I will get into that tonight. And if you're not here, maybe I'll leave it off the podcast so you can't listen. So you have to be here. <laughs> Now go with me to 1 Peter 2 verse 5. You also, say I also. I, come on, are you ready for home already now? We're not finished yet. Say I also. As living stones. Carry on reading. Hallelujah. Now the temple is not made with human hands, but with living stones. You are the temple of God. Meaning that first Christ is the rock. He is the stone, the cornerstone upon which we build our life. But not only, you know, every single time you see in the New Testament, when God uses or when, when the writers use an instance to first describe an aspect or a character of Christ. They first do that. So first, Christ is the cornerstones, but then it always translates into, you are also living stones. So it says that Jesus is the light of the world, the phos, the same place where we get the word phosphorus. Jesus is the light of the world, but then Jesus says to us, you are the light of the, the same word. What we don't understand is we know that I've taught this and preached this, but we have to get a revelation that everything that Jesus is, we are. He is the firstborn of many brethren. He is the patterned son. We are the manifested sons. He came not only to show us the Father, but to show how humans should live. If you want to see how you should live and move and act on this earth, look at Jesus. Very simple. And so we are living stones. Jacob says this is none other than the house of God in that place. Meaning, what does that mean? Are you the house of God? Are you the temple of the Holy Spirit? When God says, now... I don't live in a temple made of human hands, but I live inside of you. The Bible says that God chooses to dwell the same place where Abram pitched up a tent. It says he pitched a tent, meaning a place of dwelling where the altar of God was. He went back to a place of dwelling where God dwelt. He began to dwell. A place where there was open heavens. He pitched a tent and God stayed in that place. But now we are the temple. We are a dwelling place. That means that when God decides to use a gate of heaven, He uses... The Bible says, lift up your heads, O ye gates. Have you ever seen a gate with a... Maybe like some weird ones, you know. But no. When it says, lift up your head, O ye gates, you are a gate. Lift up your head. And what does it say? So that the King of glory may enter in. 
Ah, oh, it means that where a gate is, where an altar is set up, where a temple is, that that is God's entry point into the earth. You are a gate of heaven. You are an entry point for God to enter the earth. Not only are you an entry point, but if God lives and dwells and moves inside of you, that means if someone wants to encounter God, they must go to the altar. They must go to the temple. They must enter through the gates. Oh, I don't know if you're getting it this morning. If God wants to encounter someone, guess who he, what is the place that he uses? You. Not only do you have the ability to have an encounter with God, but you have the ability to give it. Do you receive this morning? God has made His dwelling place inside of us. Oh, that's why I'm taking so quick. I still need to do an offering. Oh my God. Okay, we're good. Say, I'm an open heaven. Not all of you said that, so only the rest will receive you. So God sets up altars in places. He sets up temples in places. He sets up places in the realm of the Spirit. How many of you know we used to travel with prophets? We'll enter into a region. Now, I don't want to talk about spirits and all of this. But man, you can just feel where there is an, specifically where there is an open heaven over a place. Amen. Where it's not dependent on you and your spirit and how you operate. It's dependent fully on the altar that has been set up there before. That is it. It's just like that. You know, prophet will tell you, you can go and minister to other places. It may be difficult. You go to Centurion HQ, heavens are open. Just like that. May it be said of this place. I said, may it be said of this place in Counter Belito. That when someone comes in and they need an encounter with God, that just like Jacob, although they did not know, that they bump into him and walk out and say, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. Amen. And then you see at the end, we fast forward 20 years later. Not once in the blessing. Go to 28 verse 20 for me, Genesis. And we're getting ready to take up an offering now. Not once do we see in the blessing that God gives to Abram and, and Isaac. Not once do we see any sort of commandment where they want to give. But here we see Genesis 28 verse 20. It says, Then Jacob made a vow saying, If this is all after, after the whole encounter, Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this Hallelujah. Which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house. And all that you give of me, surely I will give a tenth to you. The natural reciprocation after having an encounter with God is to give. The natural reciprocation. That's why we always, prophet will always say, when you, when, you, when you sit under a revelation, when you sit under a place where you've received something in a service, never ever walk out without putting something down on the altar to give to God. Never do that. It is like a ceiling. Just like I said to you earlier, there's a difference between me doing chores around the house out of works because I feel I have to or because I do it because I, I love my wife and I want her to be happy. This is the same. There's no dead works. There's no law here. The law does not exist. Some couple hundred years before, when Jacob does this, it's because he's had an encounter with God. It's because God has given him some word, some prophecy. He knows now that this place, he can never be the same again. He had an encounter. 
and he gives a vow. He says, surely I will give a tenth to you. Now I want to show you something. Fast forward 20 years later. He's busy. Um, he ends up going now on his way to Haran. Then you know he ends up with Laban, works for Laban, does the whole Rachel and Leah thing. Things start looking up. Then eventually he does some prophetic tricks. And he says, okay, Laban, any, any, uh, uh, any livestock that has spots on, which is like technically the bad ones, I will keep. The rest is yours. Then he puts a, I'm not even going to get into prophetic sight. Then he puts a pillar up with spots. And every single time the livestock look at it, they reproduce what they see. Hi, yay, yay. <laughs> Do you perceive an encounter? Then you have the ability to reproduce it. And so he goes from there. Then Laban's upset with him because he ends up getting much more livestock. God is blessing him. Then he says to his wife, listen, we need to, we need to get on out of here because we've got problems with my father-in-law. <laughs> And he ends up here. Where does he end up? Genesis chapter number 31, verse number 13. What does God say to him? 31. I am the God of... Ah. In the place where he is on the run. In the place of... Uh, uh, in the place of despair. In the place where maybe things were going bad. Now, you need to do something. And you start making decisions under pressure. Mm. It's only me, obviously. Hey, come tonight. If maybe it's a little bit you, come tonight. And stress happens and things were going well. Then they start going bad. Now, all of a sudden, God comes to him. What does God do? You see similarities and parallels here. When God goes to Abraham, he was in Egypt, the wilderness. What does he say to him? Go back to the place where you were at in the beginning. The place where you had an encounter with me. What was that place? Bethel. He comes now to Jacob. The same thing. Jacob, I see things are not going well with you. What does he say? I am the God of Bethel where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land and return to the land of your family. Leave it there. Why does God now, this is 20 years later, God is reminding him of a promise that he had made before. So for this morning, it is not only an offering message. I'm going to say to you, even in the realm of the Spirit, you made some, you made some vows to God. Maybe it was financial. Maybe it was you said, Lord, if you save my husband, I will serve you all my days. I will not miss one service. I will give you 20% of my income. If you save my business, if you get me to an income of this so that we can make ends meet, if you shift the situation, I will do this for you. And God is coming and knocking. And he's saying, have you ever found it funny when the weight of the presence is heavy, when you're down on your face before the Lord? Man, you want promises? Hey. Say, it's you. Is it you? If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's because you've never been flat on your face before the Lord. But if you had in that place, you are making endless promises to God. Yes? Hallelujah. I will serve you like this. I will do like this. Whatever you ask of me. I will do. God is coming now and he's knocking. He's saying, remember that vow. I was, he's not just saying, go back to the place of Bethel. What God is saying, he's saying, I'm the God of that vow. He's saying that you had, you gave that vow when you were in the presence of God, when you were in the glory of God. That was not the enemy whispering to you to tell you to give so much. That was me. That was the conviction you had within your spirit because you had an encounter with me and your natural response was to want to give. 
Thank you for joining us. And special thanks to those of you who give generously to this ministry. It's because of you that this ministry is possible. You can click the link in the description to give now or visit encounterchurchbelito.co.za forward slash give for more information. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to it and share it with your friends. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.